All right, the title of my sermon this morning is Glorify God in Your Body. And I got that from verse 20 in 1 Corinthians 6. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So 1 Corinthians 6 deals with a couple of issues. First of all, it deals with legal disputes within brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. And then it goes on to talk about how you should treat your body. And first it deals with one of the main ways people defile their body, which is through fornication. And I know that's what the context of the passage is talking about. But what I want to talk about today is just taking care of your body. You know, being healthy. I want to encourage you to take care of your body because this body does not belong to you. And oftentimes people abuse their body, they do not treat it well, they live unhealthily, they don't exercise. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. I just want to encourage you in, uh, is glorifying God in your body. Taking care of this body that God has given you. What does it say here in 1 Corinthians 6? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God and ye are not your own. So notice that as believers, the Holy Ghost lives in our body. Now imagine if in the Old Testament you went to the temple, right, where it symbolized where God's presence was, and it was just neglected, it never cleaned up, you know, it was graffiti all over it. You think about people getting tattoos these days, just putting graffiti all over their body. We need to think about, well, this is how, the way you ought to treat a physical temple where God would be, how you would treat the temple of God. That's how you should treat your body, right? Because your body is the temple of God. You ought not to neglect it. It ought to be presentable. It ought to be clean, right? Now, is that what's most important? No, that's not what's most important. What's most important is what's inside. But the outside does count too, right? When Jesus talked about the Pharisees, you want the inward to be clean, that the outward may appear clean also. So it's not that the outward doesn't matter. Yes, it's less important than the inward, but it is important nonetheless. And the reason why I'm talking about this today is, you know, we're coming at the time where people make New Year's resolutions, right? So sometimes people make New Year's resolutions and go, you know what, I'm going to hit the gym, or I'm going to eat better, or I'm going to cut out the, tr the junk in my life. So. Uh, I want to talk about this this morning, hopefully encourage you as you, we go into the next year, that you do think about what you eat, how you treat your body, and make sure that you are living a healthy lifestyle for the glory of God. But you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So remember, you are not only a steward, of the resources that you have, the time that you have, you are a steward of this body that God has given you. This body does not belong to you. And like you ought to treat possessions of other people with the utmost respect and care, you ought to treat your body the same way. And I feel that in today's day and age, you have to make it a point to exercise. Why? Because we live in a technological day where you know, it's, there's a lot of entertainment and people just live a very sedate lifestyle you know a lot of a lot of people nowadays don't work physical jobs you know you drive to work you sit in front of a desk you're on the computer all day and then you get home and you sit in front of the couch and you don't need to go out to find entertainment because you can just turn on the tv you can turn on the computer and you've got all sorts of entertainment youtube netflix where you can just basically just spend your whole life just sitting and looking at a screen looking at your phone so you really need to make it a point these days to look after your body and actually get active because if you don't, you're going to let yourself go, right? And you're going to put on weight, you're not going to be healthy and you're not going to be as effective for the Lord. So we need to be healthy. Now, in the Old Testament, probably the emphasis was not there, but you can see in the Old Testament, people were very active and very fit. I just want to go over two stories in the Old Testament. We can see the type of lives people had uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament, where it was very active. Obviously, they were farmers, they were doing a lot of manual labor. But sometimes when I think of the, the, the type of people, the type of men especially in the Old Testament, I've got an example of men and, and women. 
I think of Genesis 14, I think of Abraham. I don't know if you're familiar with this story. But this is when Lot was living in Sodom and there was an attack on Sodom and the cities around Sodom and Lot was taken captive. And then went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. So if you remember that city, you remember Zoar, that was when Lot was taken out, Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember he didn't want to go too far and God let him go to Zoar. So now you've seen this city here, Zoar. And they joined battle with them in the Vale of Siddim, with Kelaleoma, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elasa, four kings with five. So there's this whole battle of the kings uh, between these different cities, and Lot is in one of the cities that is at battle with, in, in this big battle. And the Vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and, there that, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. Look at this. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son. So if you didn't know that, Lot was Abraham's um, nephew, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So there's this battle between these cities, the battle of the kings. And then Lot is living in Sodom and Gomorrah at the time. Sodom is part of the group that loses the battle and are taken captive by these other kings who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped. So one escapes from this battle and told Abraham, Abraham the Hebrew. And you think, oh, are they spelling Abraham's name wrong here? No, because before, you know, there was a covenant made with God and everything um, and whatnot. God at one point changed Abraham's name to Abraham. And told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol, and brother of Ana, and these were confederate with Abraham. Now this is where I want, to, I want you to focus on. Look at this. And, and when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, look, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So notice what happened there. He finds out that his nephew is taken captive. And what does he do? Does he call the police? Does he call the army? No, he arms his own servants in his house and they go and rescue Lot. So that gives you an idea of the type of men that are in Abraham's house. These are strong men fit men. They're not men that are just sitting around, overweight, no stamina, no fitness. These are people that are fit. These are people that are healthy, right? They can go and they can fight. They know how to defend themselves. These are men that are strong. These, this is the sort of men we should be. We shouldn't be these weak men, right? We need to be fit and healthy, take care of our bodies. And we can see here, man, look, born in his own house, three 118. Now for them to just at the drop of a hat be able to just arm themselves and go to battle, you've got to think, man, they've been training for this. They've been preparing for this. Right? They're not just men that are useless. Right? They are men that know how to do things. And these are the sort of men we should be. Psalm 18. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet. So not only do you see there the strength, right? But the agility, right? My feet like hinds feet. He setteth me upon my high places. Now I realize, you know, obviously there are spiritual applications to these passages, right? Strength, talking about spiritual strength. But note, it's still a positive thing that's spoken about. It's a positive thing for us to be strong as well as strong spiritually. That's why there's the analogy that is used there. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. See, because we live in a day where we just depend on the government for everything, we depend on the government to defend us as well. Unfortunately, we live in a country where you know, we don't have the right to bear arms, we can't defend ourselves. So that's why we're just in a society now where it's like when, we're, when we need help, the government's going to help us. You know, when our house gets robbed, we've got to call the police when we assaulted. But, you know, it wasn't always like that. You know, there was a day and age where you had to defend yourself. You had to look after you to protect your own family and your own community. 
Now let's look at a female example, right? So that's a male example. Look at a female example. You say, well, women can, you know, take it easy, you know, sit on the couch, you know, watch Days of Our Lives. Or what is it these days? Not Days of Our Lives these days. Desperate Housewives. What's the latest Netflix, you worldly ones? What's the latest Netflix show that uh, women are watching? Uh, Ruth too. Look at this. Ruth is a great example of a virtuous woman. Verse 4, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. So Boaz is going into his field. If you know the story, Ruth goes to Boaz's fields to glean from the harvest that is dropped. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is it? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, so this is not now, Mo, this is not now Naomi talking, it's the, it's the servants talking to um, uh, uh, Boaz, saying this is what she asked us, right? And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sea, she. So she came and hath continued, even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house. Right, look at the hard-working nature of Ruth. You know, they don't have much, so she goes and she's gleaning the harvest behind the reapers, working from morning till even to get... Why? Because, it's, you know, when we think about gathering stuff now, you know, we go to the shops, we drive there, take our shopping cart, put it in, we have all that. But if you think in Ruth's day, no. She's, she's in the field collecting it, carrying it back collecting it again, and, and then she has to thresh that all out and then keep all the grain. But this was a great system. I don't know if you notice that this is something that is actually in the Old Testament laws, this gleaning uh, of the harvest behind the reapers. And one of the laws in the Old Testament was when you would harvest your field, you wouldn't go over it the second time. You would just go over it once, collect what you can, and then leave the rest for the poor and the widowed and the orphans. So the poor people could come afterwards and glean what was left, pick up what was dropped. And if you know the story of Ruth and, and Boaz, obviously Boaz you know, took a liking to Ruth and he started saying to the reapers, you know what, sometimes when you reap, just, just let some fall down. You know, just throw some purposefully so that she has some to pick up. And you know, if she gleans from the stuff that we haven't harvested yet, you know, don't tell her off. Just let her collect what she needs to collect. So you can see that there's a bit of a... Ruth, if you haven't read it before, it's a bit of a love story, right? Where, you know, Ruth uh, and, and Boaz end up getting married and, and they, they're actually in the lineage of Jesus Christ. That's why the, the, the couple is significant. So we see here the hard-working nature of Ruth. She's not somebody that says, oh, you know, I can't get my nails dirty. I just got my hair done. So I can't go out in the field. It's going to get ruined. Notice that this is a hard-working woman. And we, even when we read about the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, look, she girdeth her loins with strength. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Because if we go back, remember, to Psalm 18, it is God that girdeth me with strength. So whilst I, I acknowledge that women are not as strong as men, right? It's not for women to be the next bodybuilder. And I just found out today that uh, recently, you know, like the top UFC woman, women's fighter is a lesbian. So that explains a lot of things, right? Because if you're a lesbian, they're generally more manly, right? So that's not a feminine attribute to just be this hardcore manly fighter. But at the same time, it's not a feminine attribute to be just weak and useless. And I know, like, especially in the Asian culture, like some Asian women, you know, the older generation, you think about the, the diligent mum, but this, this new generation, man, are just like weak and useless and just, oh, we can't be like that, right? We have to be useful, strong, healthy people. That's something that God wants from us. Proverbs 31, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. So I'm not going to go all the way through Proverbs 31. I just want to point out this verse. But we see that the virtuous woman, one thing about the virtuous woman is that she's hardworking. She strengthens her arms. She's not just weak and useless and just thinking about her appearance all the time. So it is God's will 
for us to be, it's not God's will for us to be unfit and unhealthy. Like we read in 1 Corinthians 6, we ought to take care of our bodies. We ought to take it, make it a point to take care of our bodies. And, you know, some people have other reasons because we're talking about glorifying God in our body. That's the main reason why we should be healthy. But there are other wrong reasons for why people want to get healthy. Right? So one is people just, the only reason why they want to get healthy is they just want to feel better about themselves, just self-esteem. You know, now that's not necessarily wrong in and of itself, but that should come secondary, right? When you serve God with your body, which is His, yeah, you will feel better about that. But you don't just serve yourself and think, hey, about your self-image, your self-worth. That's one reason why people just, you know, want to want to hit the gym or they want to get fit, uh, because you know, when people are unhealthy, they're sick or they're overweight, that can lead to depression. That can lead to people being upset and you know, being down. So that's one reason why people try and get healthy but you know another reason why and I, I would say the main reason why people want to get healthy and want to look good is because they want to impress others don't they and that's not a good reason why you want to feel good and, and be healthy and whatnot you know people want to show off you know the body that they've created you know by going to the gym or show off their muscles this is not a good reason why you ought to be healthy Right? It's not a good motivator just to impress others. Right? And even, you know, I, I see like on YouTube, right? When you look on YouTube and you, you know, maybe because like I'm a 30 something year old man, I don't know if you guys get the same ads that I do. You know, have you ever seen the Asian guy with the six pack shortcuts? Always like these guys trying to, like, hey, this is how you lose weight. This is how you get ripped. This is how you get shredded. You go to the beach and you can get those chicks that you've always wanted. Should that be our mentality? Should that be a godly Christian's mentality? Like, hey, I want to go to the gym for people to look at me? No. Or what about for you ladies? Is that, is that the goal? That you go to the gym just so guys can look at me? That is an ungodly attitude that we have, that we want to you know, you want to show off what you've done in the gym. And you know what? If you're showing off your body, if people are looking at your body, that's not the attention you want. This is the ungodly attention that you don't want. And you know, Honestly, you don't need to see somebody in tights or like a really tight shirt to know that they're healthy. Right? And it's the same with ladies. If ladies feel like, hey, you know, you, obviously it's good to be trying, you know, make yourself healthy so you can attract a partner, but you don't need to be wearing the tight clothes and the low cut clothes to attract a man. You know, like men, men, you know what? Men lust after, you know, why do you think Muslims have to like wear the big tent? Because men are going to lust after women, no matter what they're wearing, right? You don't have to wear the mini skirt and wear the low cut. And, and you set a bad example for the next generation. You can just dress godly. You can tell when somebody is fit and healthy underneath. And, you know, you shouldn't be seeking that attention from people that aren't your husband, aren't your wife. So my point is, you can tell when somebody's healthy underneath their clothes. And if you want to see that, that should be for the bedroom, right? That should be between husband and wife actually seeing somebody's body in a more intimate setting. So you don't need to see someone's body to know that they're fit and healthy, and it should only be for your spouse's eyes. The last thing I want to just talk about in this uh, rather lengthy introduction is church leaders as well need to be an example. Right? So that's why I try and make it a point to be healthy, eat healthy, stay active. But you know, how many times have you seen preachers get up? And it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a cringe, really, when you see preachers get up and they're saying, oh, you should stop drinking and you should stop smoking, which I believe you should do. But yet they're up there pulling up their pants every couple of minutes because their pants can't stay up. And, and they're obviously not taking care of their own body, whether it's by laziness or whether it's by gluttony. And I think we have too many hypocritical, overweight preachers. Because really, we're meant to be setting the example to the flock, right? And if God wants us to be strong, look, take care of our body, eat healthy, it's got to start with the leaders in the church. And I think too many leaders in churches are overweight, and we see it all the time. You see your fundamental preacher up there bellowing with the big pot belly, the big bread belly, right? And that is not a good look, I think. Now, they'll say, you know, well, bodily exercise profiteth little. I was meant to put this verse in there, but I forgot to put it in there. Bodily exercise profiteth little. Yeah, it profits little, but it does profit. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's, it's still profitable. And it, even though it profits little compared to 
godliness. Now, let's get into the meat of the sermon. I want to talk about five reasons why people are unhealthy. Five reasons why people are unhealthy and hopefully encourage you not to follow suit. One is, and we'll just address this first and foremost, there are genuine medical reasons why people are unhealth, you know, unhealthy or they're unfit or they're putting on weight. Right? So I'm not ruling out the fact. It's not always the person's fault that they are they struggling to you know, be healthy or struggling to put off weight. There are genuine medical conditions. And I'm not an expert in all that, but I'm not ignorant to the fact as well that no matter how hard people try, they, they have a medical condition that is not allowing them to be healthy or, to be, uh, or not to be overweight. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. Right? We live in a world that is not perfect, where obviously DNA problems, genetic problems, and just the, the fact that our bodies are aging as well. Genesis 3, I want to just read this passage to you. This is where the curse comes into play. I want to give you some thoughts as well as I, you know, I think about this passage that you may not have thought of before. Uh, it says here, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. So I just want you to note there that when Adam ate of the fruit and God cursed the earth, he cursed the ground. So there's something that changed about the ground that Adam now had to labor in order for the ground to bring forth. But generally when we think of the curse, we also think of the, the body conditions, you know? So um, my thoughts here are, the, the curse is the curse of the ground. But generally when we think of you know, aging and getting old and our bodies breaking down and not having, you know, we're saying, hey, we have these problems these days. Is that the curse or is that something else? So let's read on. It says here, for thy sake, in, thy, in, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou re uh, shalt thou return. So we see that the curse there is the curse on the earth, and that has caused man to now have to labor by the sweat of his brow in order to make a living and for the earth to bring forth. But look what it says here. Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand, look at this, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he was placed at the east of the garden of Eden, or garden of Eden cherubims. And, um, so basically saying he's thrown Adam out of the garden. And then he's put cherubims at the gate with a flaming sword. Now cherubims, you didn't know, they're not, they're not angels. Cherubims are heavenly creatures that have wings. And I don't, I don't believe angels have wings. Angels are always look like men. And a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So notice that in Genesis 3 the ground was cursed. But not only was the ground cursed, but now they did not have access to the tree of life. Right? And why did God stop them? He said, lest they take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Right? So there's something about the tree of life that they're no longer able to access that allowed them to live forever. Now we go to Revelation 22 where the curse is, re re is reversed and, they, and we are given access back to the tree of life. Look at this. Because he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. So this is an interesting plant where, you know, you have a tree. And, I, and some people have grafted. I don't know if you've ever seen these before. If you look up grafted trees, some people have grafted tr like trees together where they actually bear different manner of fruits. It's really interesting. So it's like, that, maybe that's, that, that's why God used that analogy because it's obviously a real analogy in the world where he grafts us in and these 12 nations are all grafted onto the, the, the one tree. Because obviously the, the, probably the 12 manner of fruits would represent the 12 tribes of Israel. But this is what's interesting. Yielded her fruit every month. So I wonder if that's, 
you know, a different fruit, you're getting a different fruit every month, right? Because it bears 12 manner of fruits. And the leaves of the tree, look at this, were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. So you see how what was in Genesis 3 was the curse of the ground, no access to the tree of life. But in Revelation 22, the curse is reversed and now access to the tree of life. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. So this is my thought here when we talk about medical conditions for why our body doesn't function always the way it does. Maybe it's not so much the curse that we think about, which is the curse of the ground, but the fact that we no longer have access to this tree of life to reverse these degenerative conditions, right? Because if we had access to the tree of life and to the leaves of the tree of life, that healing could occur. And maybe that's what it's like in the new heaven and new earth. I don't know, but it'd be interesting to know. Because you know how people say, you know, the, the Bible says there's no pain there and stuff in, in the new heaven and new earth. But then you think... What if I stub my toe in the new heaven and new earth? Is that going to hurt? Or like, you know, surely if I go skydiving in the new heaven and new earth and I fall, is it going to be like the matrix where you're just like boing, boing, you know, on the ground? Or are you actually going to fall and you break something and maybe, there, it just, maybe it just doesn't hurt? I don't know how it works. Or maybe there, there's still some break, you know, sort of breaking down processes, but it's just that we can reverse them. It's like this cure-all that we can heal our body with the tree of life. Who knows, but... Just a thought there that I thought would be interesting. So medical reasons is one perfectly good example of you know, something that is out of people's control, why they are unhealthy or unable to stay in shape. But you know, also, well, I will say this, unfortunately, some medical conditions are because of what we've sown and what we're reaping, not taking care of our body earlier on. You know, now people have medical conditions that they are finding hard to manage. And even if people have, like let's say you have a genetic uh, you know, a genetic uh, what's it, a disposition to putting on more weight or slower metabolism or you have an illness that, you know, maybe doesn't get you get it act as active, that doesn't mean you should just give up. You know, you should still try and, you try and manage those symptoms and still try and stay active because you don't want to, you know, just further accelerate the decline by not doing anything at all. So even if somebody has a genuine medical condition, it doesn't mean that your health can't be at least managed or limited to a certain point. And the last thing I want to say just about this medical conditions is you also don't want to make, use it to make excuses for yourself. You know, some people, you know, they, they, they know they're not doing what they should or being active and eating right and then they just want to, oh, it's probably because it's genetic, it's probably just because of this. Oftentimes people just use it as an excuse, right? So you don't want to use it as an excuse. Try your best to manage the symptoms and, and do your best to stay fit don't just use it as a reason to give up. So that's one, re one reason, is just medical issues. Number two, another reason why people are unhealthy or unfit is it's just because of it through ignorance. They just don't know how to be fit. They don't know the right way to do it. Right? In terms of, and, the, and the ways that they are doing it is just making them worse. Hosea 4, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So I just want to focus there that sometimes if you don't know the right things, you can cause yourself unhealth as well because you're just ignorantly following what you've been told and you haven't sort of looked into it, know how the body works. We, need to, we, don't, we don't want to be ignorant people in general, even on this topic, right? But we, we need to know what it means to be healthy, Get healthy in a healthy way. Get fit in a healthy way. Some people lose weight in very unhealthy ways, and that's not good. Proverbs 1. Look at what it says here. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. It's always a good idea to keep learning. Keep learning new things. Right? You can never know enough. Right, don't get to the point where you feel like you know it all. Look at what it says here in Ecclesiastes 4. Better is a poor and a wise child. Why is it a wise child? Because a wise man will hear, will increase learning, than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. See, how many older people in the older generations, they feel like they've arrived, they're settled in life, they're financially stabled, but you can't correct them on anything. They, never, they feel like they know everything. 
That's a very dangerous situation to be in, especially if you're not saved. How many people like that do we meet out door to door? Yeah. Right? Oh, I've heard all that. Yeah. Hey, you young in, I've lived a longer life than you. You, you can't teach me anything. Right? Oh no, this candlestick's getting removed out of its place. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. So what, is, what are some ways where if you're ignorant, that can affect your health? What about blindly following established medical practice? You know, people just go, oh, they're sick, just go to the doctor, I go to your GP, what do they give you? Something just to cover up the symptoms. Take this drug, take that drug. You know, there is a place for what's called allopathic medicine. Right? Allopathic medicine is the surgery, the drugs, you know, to manage symptoms, to help. Sometimes you need surgery. Sometimes you need drugs to suppress some symptoms in order to allow your body to heal. But allopathic medicine is not always the answer to everything. Right? And you need to realize that in the medical world, there is a fight going on between different philosophies. It's like there's a fight going on in every area of life between different philosophies. And you don't want to be ignorant of the fact that you know when you go to the doctor, you're only getting one opinion. You're just getting one thing and you just don't think, oh, I just go to the doctor and everything they tell me is right. You, know, you watch the doctors on TV, they're generally allopathic practitioners rather than naturopathic practitioners or homeopathic or you know there's chiropractic practitioners there's all these other you know, even Chinese medicine like herbal practitioners right there's a lot of different ways people treat the body and no one discipline has all the answers but if you're ignorant of this and you're just blindly following whatever you know I've, I've got cancer I must do the chemotherapy you don't look at other ways there are people out there that have healed that have healed their cancer cured their cancer you think about how many millions of dollars they put into trying to cure cancer and find a cure for cancer, find it, and then all you have to do is YouTube, cure for cancer. And all sorts of people that have cured their cancer by eating raw fruits and vegetables and doing this and doing that. Am I saying that that's the answer to all cancer? No. What I'm saying is sometimes people are ignorant of the information that is out there and through to their own ignorance, they go down a path of treatment and they do damage to their own body. Right? So there's a place for allopathic medicine, the drugs and the surgery. But drugs and surgery cannot fix an unhealthy lifestyle. Right? If you have an unhealthy lifestyle, you can manage those things. You might be able to deal with the problems that you've caused, but that's not going to bring you back into good health. You know, you need to be eating right, you need to be active. Right? So it's the same. Your body, if you're sick and your body's not healing itself, you, your body can't use drugs to heal itself. Your body needs food to heal itself. So it's what you eat is what's going to allow your body to heal. And you need to get active in order to lose weight. So you're burning off those calories. Now, I knew a guy that couldn't control how much he was eating. He wasn't getting fit. And then, you know, because it's covered by Medicare, he went and got his stomach tight. You know, that's, not, that's not going to help the problem. That's just delaying the problem further down. Yeah, but this is what people think. They think, oh, I've got this problem with eating, I'll just get the liposuction. Yeah. You know, I'm not taking care of my body, so my skin's like not good, I'll just get the plastic surgery. You know? Or like, you know, I can't control what I eat, I just get my stomach tired. Your body needs nutrition to regenerate. You can't build a body with prescription drugs. And not only that, if you just blindly take the prescription drugs, oftentimes these prescription drugs are addictive. You know, people get on these prescriptive drugs in order to help this or help that, help their depression, help this condition, and then they start getting addicted to those drugs. And then the side effects of those drugs is what is causing a lot of their health problems. What about women on the pill? You know, women on birth control pills, just thinking they should be on them to regulate their menstruation, or God forbid they're trying to fornicate, they take the pill. You know, but some people in the States, they just think, oh, when they get to a certain age, you just get on the pill because that's just something that women should do. You know, that, that ignorance is just causing issues in their body. Or what about low cholesterol treatments? You know, a lot of people, like again, this is a, there's a battle out there on what is good for you. And sometimes people think, oh, you know, you're, you're, the cholesterol's up, they put you on this low cholesterol treatment, low cholesterol drugs, take out all the cholesterol out of your food, and then you start realizing you're going crazy because your, body, because your brain has no fat to actually you know, build on, and then, then you bring on an early onset of Alzheimer's. Ian was actually talking to me about that just recently, because 
uh, he said when he, he was having some, some illness, some high cholesterol, and then that's what he just realized when he went off the cholesterol and everything, he just he's, he's, he couldn't think, he couldn't function, because right? his brain wasn't working right. And then he, that's when he realized, oh, there's good fats and bad fats, and you need fat to build the brain. So sometimes his ignorance doesn't help you. Um, dieting fads is another thing where people are ignorant. You know, the yo-yo dieting where you just, you know, you think you can lose weight by just taking this miracle shake and all that's doing is starving your body, you're, you know, you're losing all your muscle. Because yeah, sometimes, you know, women, what's wrong with the yo-yo dieting? The yo-yo dieting is because women lose all this weight really fast by starving themselves, but because they've lost it in an unhealthy way and, and they're just measuring their weight by the scale, they don't realize they just lost all their muscle. Right? All your muscle's gone. That's why like, their face just like, looks disheveled and they're so like, weak. You know, they, they feel good about it. It's like, I've lost all this weight. But then as soon as they get off the starvation diet, they just put it all back on. You know what comes back on now that they don't have as much muscle? Fat comes back on. That's why they call it the yo-yo diet because you lose muscle and you gain fat. You lose muscle, gain fat. And then after you've, di you've yo-yo dieted for a while, you're actually in a worse position because now you're the same weight you have less muscle and you have more fat, your metabolism has dropped even more. So it's just the ignorance of these things, right? The, the fat-free, you know, you say, oh, we're going to get the fat-free yogurt, the fat-free milk, it's all got sugar in it, you know, fat-free desserts. But just because something's fat-free doesn't mean it's healthy, right? So there's this big fat-free craze that's, that was going on. I think people are starting to wake up to the fact now. But I will say this as well. The other way, just because something is organic doesn't mean it's healthy either. Did you know that? Because people are like, oh, you know, we're not eating all the pros. I only eat organic or, or gluten-free, right? Just because something's gluten-free and something's organic, don't be so ignorant to think, oh, it's, therefore it's healthy. I drink the organic sodas. I eat the organic candy. And you know, this, this bag of corn chips is gluten-free and organic. So I just eat the whole bag of corn chips. Right? That doesn't mean things are good for you just because they're organic or gluten-free. Don't be ignorant to the fact that people use these terms to sell you stuff. Right? So you need to be aware of what's going out there, not be ignorant. Right, let's go on to number three. So first one was medical reasons. Second one, people are just ignorant sometimes about how to be healthy. Right? Dieting the wrong way, eating the wrong things. Number three is laziness. Laziness is a reason why people are unfit and unhealthy because they just don't want to get out there and move. Now the Bible has a lot to say about laziness. You would have noticed the creature that is described in the Bible as the sluggard, right? Kind of like where we get the words, the slug, you know, just lazy, just leaving this trail behind. My wife is so freaked out by slugs. That is something I learned that when we got married, she hates she ate slugs. Remember there's like a slug on the house. I can be the man and then get that slug off the wall. I, I still struggle with cockroaches and spiders, so I've just got to, got to get over that. Proverbs 20, look at this. The sluggard will not plough by reason of the cold. Look at this, there's always an excuse, isn't there? Why not to do things? Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Proverbs 26 has a lot to say about the slothful man, the sluggard. See it thou a wise, a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. You know what's interesting is that you know, lazy people generally aren't fools. You know, they're generally wise enough to figure out how not to do things. Right? But the Bible says they're wise in their own conceit because it's not good for them to figure out how to like, not always do things. There is more hope of a fool than of him. Why? Because a fool at least maybe doesn't think about it and does it anyway. Right? And at least learns from that. But a wise man won't even bother trying to do it, to learn. A slothful man, say it, say it. There is a lion in the way, a lion is in the streets. What does that remind you of? Man, it's always too hard for the lazy person. There's always a reason why they can't do it. To the point where he's saying, I can't go outside, I can't do it. There's a lion out there that's going to kill me. You know, maybe I'll die from a plane crashing on me or something. So they make up all these excuses why they can't get out there and do something. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed, oversleeping. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. Look at this. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. So notice how we started there. See, is thou a wise man in his own conceit? So this is talking about the lazy person. 
A sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. So there's always, there's always a reason why not to get active, right? You can always think of reasons not to get active, but you don't want to be a sluggard. And if you are, it's going to be a slow decline. You know, you don't just get unfit and unhealthy overnight. You know, it's just little by little. You let yourself go and before you know it, you're like, you put on a lot of weight, you're unhealthy, and it's going to be even a struggle at that point to get it off. So that's why it's just consistency is the key. It's a little bit every day. Now, whenever I talk about the slugger, this is one passage I always really love, and that's the field of the slothful. This is when Solomon walks by the field of a lazy person. Look what he says. He says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. So we think about what we're applying it today. We're thinking about our body, right? So just like the field of the slothful, he's not maintaining his field. He's not looking after it. Over time, it's slowly getting worse and worse. They're saying, hey, the plants are starting to grow over. Not only that, the, the wall that was there was broken down. Look at what Solomon says. He says, Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. So you see, you don't always have to learn through your own experience. You can learn from other people's experience, other people's bad example. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. So notice there how Solomon walks past the field of the slothful and he realizes, hey, this field didn't just get like this overnight. And oftentimes with people that are unhealthy or unfit, obviously they did not get there overnight. It's been a lifestyle of just laziness, of not doing anything about it and getting to that point. So that lifestyle needs to change. And it's going to be tough. You know, when, when, you've, when, you, know, when you, you think about when you take care of a field, if it's covered with nettles and thorns and the stone wall is broken down, hey, just starting on that field is going to be tough. And once you get it to a point where it's maintaining itself, it's a little easier to maintain it than it is to just do a huge redo from the very beginning. So that's why you really just got to start. You know, don't think about, what, you know, the lion in the streets. You know, don't think about the further down the way. You know, a lot of successful people say, hey, just think about the next step. Just get your clothes on, just do one, just, and just try and be consistent. But what are some tips to help lazy people to do, do some exercise? I mean, one thing is, you know, one thing you could do is just exercise while you're watching something. You know, all of us now, I'm sure every one of us spends at least, you know, half an hour, an hour on the phone or on the computer watching something on YouTube. I mean, rather than just sitting there listening to somebody monologue, you know, just take 10 minutes, take 15 minutes, do some push-ups, just get active, do some jumps, do some star jumps, to, just to get your heart beating for the time of that video. That's one thing I find as well. Whereas I find myself, if I'm just sitting there watching something, learning something, I say like, hey, you know what? I should do some push-ups. So this is why I'm listening. I'm just like in my little room, just doing some push-ups, trying to keep myself active. So just do the same. Just, just put some time aside and just get it done. You know, it's like your Bible reading. Just put some time aside and just get it done. 10 to 15 minutes a day. We've all seen those ab workout videos. You know, they just say, hey, just 15 minutes a day. You get that up. Then you realize how hard that 15 minutes a day is to actually do. But they're right, you know. If you did that for 15 minutes a day, you would have rock hard abs like those people on the, on, on the, on the show. So just a little bit every day. Um, just find that time. You know, one thing I heard on a video as well is sometimes it's mental, and everyone's different, right? Well, whatever works for you, but sometimes it's a lot easier just to set that time aside, get it done, and then know that you've done it. Rather than people trying to like, oh, you know, I'm going about my everyday, okay, when I pick up this, I'm gonna do my squats. Because one thing I've heard somebody say is, you know, when you're trying to just like work it into your day, like all throughout the day, then you've just got this like burden of having to do the exercise like all throughout the day just hanging on you. And sometimes it's easier just, you know what, let me just do like 10, 15 minutes of an intense workout and then I've done for the day. You know, and then you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the day. It's not just hanging over your head. That's one way you can do it. Another way is just, you know, schedule it into your calendar. 
You know, make sure you set time aside for it. Don't just go, oh, I'm going to exercise when I feel like it, when I get time. Make it a part of your schedule. If you make it a part of your schedule, I've always been told, hey, that which gets scheduled gets done. Uh, another way is, you know, do it with a group. If you're not one that's self-motivated, you know, join a group. Join the, you know, there's always these groups that are going on at the gyms or maybe get together with a few friends. Motivate each other. Set it in your schedule. Meet at a place so that you'll go and you'll actually do it. Or another thing you can do is find something that you actually enjoy doing. You know, just because you need to get active, that doesn't mean you have to go jogging if that's not your thing. That doesn't mean you have to go to the gym, you're a bit self-confident. Find something active that you enjoy doing. See, for me, I'm not the sort of person, I, I hate just doing the solo activities. Like, um, for me to stay healthy, I would not just like go for the long rides or go for the long jogs or go to the gym on, on the treadmill. Like, to me, I have to do something competitive. That's for me. So I have to be either playing soccer or doing something to push myself to, to want to do that. Whereas if I just do it on my own accord, generally I don't push myself to the level I would where I'm competing. So find something you're interested in. You know, whether it's a hobby that's active, um, maybe you need to compete. Or let's say you're somebody, you like sightseeing. So why don't you, you know, if you like sightseeing, then make, walk there. And then when you walk, make it a point to walk briskly to get your heart pumping. Be active. You know, park a bit further away so that forces you to walk. There's some tips that you can do to overcome that laziness. And you know what? When you start getting your energy back, when you start getting healthier, it's going to be a lot easier to do as well. But just don't, don't give up. Keep, keep going. you just got to start. And when you start, um, just, just like little by little, you got unhealthier when you start. Little by little, before you know it, you'll be healthy as well and you'll be in a good way. All right, number four. These, are, these ones are a bit shorter. Too busy. People say, ah, and I just don't have time to exercise. I'm just too busy. And you know, sometimes if you're too busy, it's like when I say, if you're too busy for church, then you're too busy. Right? It's because everyone's got the same amount of time in the day. Too busy is not really an excuse. This just means that you haven't prioritized it enough to make it a point to do it. Why? Because you're not too busy to do the, the fun things in life. You're not too busy to do the things you enjoy. You're not too busy to go on the holiday, do the things that are pleasurable for you. So that's why we all have that time. It's just whether or not you're going to prioritize the things that are important in life, like God, keeping your, your body healthy, and obviously your family, and all these other things, right? So we all have time in the day. It's all about priorities. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And then some people are too busy because they're working too much. Right? You're working like six, seven days a week, and you're working long hours, and you work yourself to death where you don't have your health anymore. You know, and, and when you, and you're working, I mean, wh how, you've got to think, like, what is the purpose of this life? Is the purpose of this life to just make as much money as you can, to be as, to be as comfortable as you can, to the detriment of your spiritual life? And to the detriment of your physical life? You know, what is it going to be worth to you? Like we talked about it when we're raising kids, right? We talk about it when we talk about raising children. You work so much that you neglect your children and then people get to an age where, they, where you think, how much money are you willing to spend to undo that? And if you're young now, you have a chance to change that. You have a chance to change the course of your future. Don't make the same mistakes as previous generations have where they've just been a workaholic and they've neglected their family, right? Or you work so much that you neglect your own health. Because how much, you know, when, when people lose their health, they give anything to get their health back. So like Solomon walked past the field of the slothful and learned from them, you ought to walk past previous generations and learn from them rather than having to go through that experience yourself. Because what is it going to be worth to you when you lose your health? You would give all the money in the world to have your health back, right? So make the difference now because you're going to reap what you sow. What good is wealth if you have no quality of life to even enjoy it? Right? You work so hard. Yeah, am I saying that people can't take a break? If you work really hard when you're young and you make some money, yeah, you, you know, if people have their leisure now throughout their life, if somebody works hard in order to have some leisure later, is that okay? That's fine. But don't work it to the point where you're not taking care of your health and you're too busy to, like I said, eat healthy, prepare the right meals, you're always eating out, or too busy to get yourself 
moving. Remember what the point of life is. And the last one, number five, why people are unhealthy, is because of bad habits. And we'll go back to where we started in 1 Corinthians 6 when we talk about bad habits. People just have bad habits that are detrimental to their health. 1 Corinthians 6, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So what is that talking about? Being addicted to certain things. Bad habits that are hard to break. Philippians 4, look what it says here. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. So what are some principles that ought to guide the sort of people we should be as believers? One is we should not be addicted to bad habits, right? Smoking, drinking, you know, sugar as well. You know, don't think, well, I don't smoke, I don't drink. Yeah, but maybe every time you go out and eat or every time you eat, you have to have that soft drink with it. You have to have that sweet drink. You know, maybe you've got a bad habit. When you go get dessert, you get too much. And sometimes when I see people eating cake or eating ice cream, uh, sometimes I'm like, I can't believe people even eat that much sweets. Because like, you know what happens? When you eat too much sweet things, your body gets used to the sweet taste. So you need to eat more in order to get that same hit. It's, sugar is like a drug. And that's why people that drink a lot of sweet drinks, they need to eat sweeter things. Because it's just like, they're like, oh, this just doesn't taste good to me. That's why when you go out and eat stuff at the restaurants, you know, like Chinese restaurants, and you just eat that stuff, you just feel like it's just coated with sugar. Because they have to do that for the, your average person to feel like, hey, hey, this tastes good. So whenever you eat something out and you're like, oh, this tastes good, generally it's because they put a lot of sugar into it. That's why it's good sometimes to make your own food. But that's how it works. The more sweet stuff you eat, the more of that palate you have for sweet things. And if you can break that habit, right, start of, start, and you just do it one step at a time. Maybe you just start by saying, you know what, instead of drinking the soft drink with my lunch today, I'm just going to drink water. You know, if you can replace those sweet drinks with water and you reclimatize your palate to not eat sweet, you will realize just how sweet the stuff you are drinking and eating are. You know, where you now drink the Coca-Cola and you're just like, whoa, man, if you just drink straight Coca-Cola, it's just like unbelievably sweet. And one reason why sweet drinks are so bad for you, because you're consuming so much sugar in such a small amount of time. See, if you were to eat the amount of sugar in a can of Coke, you'd probably make yourself feel sick, right? Like eating that seven teaspoon, 17 tables, tablespoons of sugar. But when you drink it, because it's just flowing past your tongue, straight into your body, you don't even realize how much sugar you are taking in and the damage you are doing to your body. So people have these bad habits, right? Like I said, smoking is one of them. You know, where you may be unhealthy because you're smoking. Or you may be drinking too much coffee. You think, oh, I don't drink the soft drinks. But people have one, two coffees every day, and then they put two, three, you know, sugars into that coffee. Coffee is another sweet drink where people are consuming a lot of sugar. And like I said, large portions of dessert, like I said, it, I'm sometimes perplexed when, you know, sometimes when I eat ice cream with people, and I'm like, one scoop is enough, and then I see somebody, their bowl is just full of ice cream. I don't know how they finish all that, that one even throw up. But like I said, if you've climatized your palate to sweet things, you'll be able to eat that much and not even realize the damage you're doing to your body. It's not good to, to take that huge sugar hit. And like I said, unhealthy habits is not always just like smoking and drinking, right? Or taking drugs. Unhealthy habits can be, you know, maybe you've got a habit where you don't eat breakfast and then for morning tea, you have a coffee and a cake. And that's a bad habit that you're in. You're just like, oh man, I've got to have my coffee and my cake. And then you're eating a sweet drink and a sweet dessert as the first thing you've eaten in the day. You just hit your body with all this sugar. Like I said, too much overeating. Or another bad habit would be too much entertainment. You have too much of a sedate lifestyle where what you enjoy are things where you're just sitting around watching things and doing nothing. You don't, you're not into the habit of actually being active. So what are some tips that I can give you there? Is One thing is, you know, sometimes trying to get healthy again can be overwhelming. So just, like I said, just focus on one thing at a time. When you think about your diet, you know, you may look at somebody like myself or you may look at other people in the church and you just think like, oh man, I can never like do all the things that they're doing and eat the things that they're eating. But you know what, guys? We didn't get there overnight. 
it's not like the way, the, the, our lifestyle there now, there was a day and age where I was the young guy just eating out and eating the soft drinks and not taking care of myself. I was there once, right? So I understand. And it wasn't like I just turned it off at the flick of a switch. You know the first thing that I did when I made it a point to try and be healthy is I cut out the sweet drinks. I said, you know what? I'm not drinking soft drinks anymore. I'm not gonna drink the juice anymore all the time. I'm just gonna try and replace it with water. That was the first thing I tried to do. And then I realized after I replaced the sweet drinks with water, it's like I couldn't stomach the sweet drinks anymore. I couldn't stomach the sweet stuff anymore. And that really helped me get off overeating on these things. Another tip can be you journal what you eat. If you're having trouble putting what's in your mouth, putting into your mouth too much things, if you journal what you eat and you keep track of it, then you'll be more conscious about what you're eating. You'll know when you're snacking. You'll know that you've, you know, I was snacking, but I ate the whole bag, you know? Or you'll know that like, I, I didn't eat anything here and then I ate something sweet. And you'll be more self-conscious of that. It's the same tip I give for people with finances as well. And another bad habit might be maybe you're eating the wrong type of foods. You know, when you eat, you're eating too many carb types and it's not sustaining you throughout the day. And one thing I always learned was, you know, when you eat, you want to eat more protein because protein takes your body a bit longer to break down and it keeps you fuller for longer. So if you eat more protein in your diet, it's going to last you more and you may be able to avoid some of the snacking that you find yourself doing during the day. If, you know, you're eating, you know, you know a toast for breakfast, right, which is carb, and then you eat like a rice for lunch and then you eat pasta for dinner, that's probably why you're getting hungry throughout the day because you're just eating carbs that turns into sugar really quickly in your body and you're not eating enough proteins where it needs to sort of break down. And you notice that, you know, even when you think about the Bible, strong meat, there's a reason why meat is referred to as what's strong because it takes a bit longer to break down, a bit harder to chew on, keeps yourself healthy for a bit longer. Anyways, that's five reasons why people are unhealthy. Medical reasons, sometimes it's ignorance, laziness, too busy or unhealthy habits. You know, you want to overcome these things. But I want to end on this thought and just going back to the beginning. Why ultimately do we want to be healthy as Christians? Why do we want to take care of our body? Because it's not just the length of life, it's the quality of life. Right? And when it comes to quality of life, why do you need quality of life? It's so that you can serve God to a more, to a more effective degree. You know what, like see, if you have 80 years of this life, but by the time you're like 50, you know, you're struggling to walk, you've got this problem, that problem, you're on this medication, that medication, you're like, oh man, I can't even get out there and knock the doors, I can't get involved in church, I can't do these things, I, you know, my brain's not working right, so I can't study the Bible like I used to, to at least engage in conversation. That's why you want to take care of your health, because we want to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ. And if we have, like, say, let's say we have 50 years to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, or 60 years to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, if you can serve Jesus Christ with that full 60 years, you're going to do so much more than if you can only serve with 30 of those years, because for the last you know, 30 years or 20 years, you know, maybe you shorten your life, or the last few decades of your life, you're just constantly having these health issues and in and out of the hospital, rather than being able to live a full life serving the Lord. So we ought not just strive for health just so that we can enjoy it for our own fleshly desires. We ought to be trying to glorify God in our body so that we can serve the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Don't ever forget that. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the health that we have. At least to be able to come here today, hear your word. I pray, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us to know that this body does not belong to us, that, Lord, we ought to take care of it. And, uh, Lord, it's, it's going to be a struggle for a lot of us to, to get into a healthy lifestyle. But, Lord, help us just to take that one step at a time, Lord, to, that we can not only take care of our own health, not only be a good example for the next generation and for the people around us, but also, Lord, that we may live long, healthy lives so that we can be the most effective witness for you, not only in our youth, but also in our later life. Thank you, Lord. Help us. Uh, we, need, we need help, Lord. It's so easy to be lazy, so easy to be 
uh, not do the right thing. So help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.